Hey what's up guys, Yankee here and in this video we will be talking about integrating code interpreter with large language models. Whenever you generate code, you can execute the code immediately to either get a result or take an action based on the code that's being generated. So let's take a look at what amazing things this can do. So this is what our application looks like. We can select the execution environment for our code. Uh, we can choose not to execute the code at all with the non option. We can execute the code inside of a Docker container, which is a safe option that we should all consider. And the last one is the local where we will be executing the code on our local machine. So if you just want result of some computation, you can use a Docker container. And if you want to take some action, it's better to use the local mode, but you always have to be careful what code is being executed on your machine. For this demo, I'm going to choose the local mode and I'll have my prompt open GitHub trending page. If I run this, it's going to generate a script and open GitHub trending page on my browser. Similarly, for the next example, I can ask what is my disk uses and it's going to write the code and yes, indeed, this is correct. So this is going to be a fun demo for this. I'm going to pull out my file explorer. I'm going to split. I have a local directory on my computer on the right side of the screen and here I'm going to add a prompt in the desktop test data directory arrange the file based on their type. So I have images and I have PDF document. Let's see the results. So it's generating the code. And as you can see, all of my PDFs were put into the PDF directory and all the images were put into the PNG directory. So I'll put my next prompt here create a bar chart showing the growing use case of generative AI. So this will be using dummy data or synthetic data to generate the chart. As you can see, it has generated the chart based on the dummy data it created, but you can modify this application, add a file upload feature, or you can paste your data here and ask it to generate charts or whatever diagrams that makes understanding of the data feasible. Now for the final example, we are going to create a website and run it on port 8080. Let's take it for a spin. We will be creating an exact replica of whatever UI we have for this application. Now I can go to localhost 8080. And as you can see, we have a code generated by AI that's running on our computer. So this is the demo of code interpreter using large language models. You can do a lot of interesting stuff with this. So let's move on to building the application and understand how code interpreter works. To get started, let's create our project directory. Let's create our virtual environment, activate it and install our dependencies. For this, we are going to use Streamlit and Langchain with Google Gen AI. If you want to see how you can use local models using Olama, please refer to the previous video on function calling and creating a chat application. Once we have our dependencies installed, I'm going to open my code editor. On my code editor, I have created a file called app.py, which is going to be our main module for the application. So first of all, let's create the basic skeleton of our application. So we are going to import Streamlit as ST. We are going to set the name of the application as code interpreter. And we are going to set the header with the same name. And we are going to create a form where user can enter their prompts. And then we have a run button to run all of this. So let's run this application and see how this looks. It's running on 8501. If I open this, we got the basic layout of our application. We will add the menu to choose local and Docker execution environment later on. Once we have the basic structure of our application, let's add the prompt. In this application, we are going to have two prompts and this is the first one for local execution. So this is going to be a system prompt that we are going to pass to the large language models with strict instruction on how it should be generating the output. So here, the first instruction says that if the question does not require writing code, provide a clear and concise answer without generating any code. We just want the large language model to generate the code without any explanation. We are also asking the model to think step by step on how to solve the problem so we get the proper result every time. And we are also explicitly mentioning that if the code involves doing anything with the system level task, it needs to identify the platform where the home directory is so that it can execute the code successfully. And all of the code that it generates, it has to be inside of the Python block because here we are instructing the large language model to generate Python code only. We are also making sure all the imports are there. Since we will be running the code, we are making sure there is always a section in the code where we are invoking the function or calling the file. 
And this is the interesting bit. So whenever we are asking the large language model to generate charts, graph or anything visual, we are asking them to convert it to image and save it to the TMP directory so that we can fetch it later on and display it to the user. With that in place, let's set up our large language model. So for this, I'm going to import chat Google generative AI followed by human message and system message to encompass the system message that we send to the large language model and the human message meaning the prompt passed by the user. Now we are going to create a chat history with a variable called messages. The local execution prompt that we created earlier is going to be passed as a system message. And if the user has pressed the run button, then we are going to kick off our process of using the large language model. So for this, I'm using Google's Gemini model 1.5 Pro and the prompt passed by the user is going to be appended on the messages, which is the chat history as a human message. And then we are going to invoke the large language model, asking it to stream all the response that it generates. And then we are going to stream the response on the UI of our application. Now that we have this setup, we need to create a Google API key to run the large language models. So for this, I'm going to go to Google's AI studio. The link will be in the description below. So from here, I'm going to click on get API key. And then you can select create API key and create or select one of the projects from here. Once you have your API key, you can come to your terminal and export the Google API key with a variable Google API key followed by your API key. When we have the API keys on our shell environment, the chat Google generative AI class automatically takes those API key to send requests to the Gemini servers. And with this, we have already created a basic application that uses large language model. So let's go to our application. So with that, I can ask the application, which is the highest mountain in the world, and it will use the underlying generative AI model to give me an answer, which is Mount Everest. So it can now take the user input and generate code. Now that we have the ability to generate code using large language model, let's try to fetch them so that we can execute it later on. For this, I'm going to import regex and right after the messages, I'm going to create a function called get code group. So this will basically take the LLM response as its input. And with regular expression, we are searching for the code block, which contains triple backticks with Python. And that ends with triple backtick. We are searching against the LLM response and re.all grabs all the text, including the line break, which includes the slash and character. So for debugging, we are just going to print whatever code match was found. If there is no code match, we are going to print no code match found in the response and we are just going to return false. And if there is a code match, we are going to select the first group of the match and return it. We can grab the code from the response. Now let's create the capability to execute the code. For this, we are going to need a couple of imports. This includes OS subprocess to run our commands and temp file to store the code generated by large language models. With that in place, let's create our function to execute the code locally. So for this, we are going to create a function called execute local. It's going to take temporary file path as its input, and it's going to use subprocess.run to run cell commands from the Python process itself. For this example, I'm using Python 3.10, but you can use Python 3.11 or whatever Python version you have on your machine and the file path, which contains our code to be executed. We are going to capture both the standard out and standard error from the terminal. And we are going to grab them as text. The timeout for this is going to be 10 seconds. So if the code execution does not complete within 10 seconds, we are going to return a timeout error. Once the code is completed executing, we are going to print uh, running code completed. And we are also going to get the STD out if the return code is zero. So in the shell environment, if the return code is zero, that means the code ran successfully. If it's non-zero, then there was an error. So if it was zero, we are going to just return the STD out, which means whatever is the output we get from executing the code. And if not, we are going to return the error. And finally, since we are using temporary file path, we are going to delete them by using os.onlink and passing the path to the temporary file. Now, once we have these two functions in place, we are going to utilize them in our main code block. Here, first of all, once we get the output from the large language models, we are going to get the code group with our get code group function. And once we know we have the output and once we know we have a code on the response that we can execute, we are going to create a temporary file using the temp file module. So we are going to create a temporary file with read access. The suffix of the file is going to be .py and we are not going to delete this file automatically since we are using context manager. Whenever the context of this indentation ends, the file is deleted automatically. But in our use case, we do not want to do that. So whatever code we have grabbed from the get code group function, we are going to write it to our temporary file and we are going to get the temporary file path with the temp file dot name. And for debugging, we are also going to print the temporary file path. 
Once we have the file path, now the next step is pretty obvious. We are going to pass the file path into the execute local function, which is going to use subprocess.run to execute our Python file. So we just pass this into the execute local function and whatever output we get from the execution, we just write it to our UI. So let's take this for a spin. I am again going to write the same prompt, but in this case, it's going to generate an answer as well, apart from just generating the code. As you can see, we have the password generated with the code. Since this is all running locally, I can also do open hacker news and then it can open a tab on my browser as well. Note that running arbitrary code on your machine is always a disaster. So you should be careful what kind of prompts you are writing, what kind of code it's generating and what kind of code it's executing on your local machine. To be on the safe side, you can pass the code generated by the large language model back to the large language model and ask it to evaluate if this causes any harm to the system. We are not going to do this in the demo, it's out of the scope, but we are going to take another security measure which is running code on an isolated environment which is inside of a Docker container. We also need to add the functionality of generating emails with our applications. So if it finds any extension like .png and .jpg, it's going to generate an image on our UI. Uh, we are using executed result.strip because the generated output has white spaces and new line characters so we want to get rid of all of that to get a pure path to our image. If it does not contain any image extensions then we are just going to write whatever output we got from executing the code. So to be able to run the code inside of a docker container we need to create our own custom docker image which contains all the dependencies that is required to run most of the code that we might be generating for our use case. So for this I'm going to create a docker file. And this is going to be our Docker file. We are pulling the Docker file from public.ecr.aws. Uh, it's going to be Python 3.11.10 and Slim Bookworm. I'm also using a here doc syntax in the run statement. So for the code that will be running inside of the here doc, I have this configuration here. If any of the command fails, it needs to exit immediately. And whenever these lines are being executed, it shows which lines are being executed. So it's for that. Uh, these are the basic libraries that I will need on my docker container to execute the code let's say if i want to generate some plots bar graphs or things like that i can use matplotlib if your use case encompasses more tools feel free to add more tools here with that in place we are going to build our docker image the name of the docker image is going to be code interpreter demo and the context is going to be the current location wait until this is built so we have our docker image code interpreter demo ready to be used as an execution environment so to use docker as an execution environment in our program we also need to install the docker sdk using pip install docker once we have this installed let's go back to our code let's import docker and from the path lib import the path class next kind of like the execute local function we are going to have a execute docker function which is going to again take the temporary file path to instantiate the docker client we need to do docker from env which gives us a docker client and then we are going to run our image which is going to be code interpreter demo with the tag of latest and for the command we are going to run python followed by the path where the python script exists and for this we are also doing a volume mount where we are mapping the directory where our temporary python file exists inside of the docker container on the path slash application and the mode is going to be read write because we are going to be saving images and other stuff inside of the container which is going to be mapped back to our machine which we will show to the user the remove equals to true argument makes sure that whenever this container is done running it automatically cleans up or removes the container so you don't have any stopped container on your machine so after executing the code inside of the container, whatever output we get, we will decode it and return it. If there is any exception while running the code, we will just return the exception saying uh, failed running the container with whatever error messages we get from the container. And finally, same as the execute local. Once we are done executing the temporary file, we are going to do os.onlink, which will basically remove the file from the temporary directory. Now that we have an execution environment for Docker, we are also going to need a separate system prompt for the docker execution as well primarily because on the local execution we are saving the image on the slash tmp location but when we are executing inside of the docker container we are going to save this on the slash app location that's why on the execute docker function we have the bind mount on slash app directory so both the prompt are identical apart from the last line where it says that convert them to image and save it to the slash app location and return as well as print just the name of the image without the path 
but on the local execution we are getting the whole image path because it's on the local machine and we can just get it but here we just need the file name i'm going to collapse both of these because they are taking a lot of screen space so right after the header i'm going to create a ui for selecting which environment to run the code on so we can do that using sd.select box so I'm going to write a select environment for code execution and the options are going to be none where we don't want to execute our code in any way. Uh, the second one is docker which executes the code in the docker container and local which executes the code on the local machine. And we are also going to pass the help text explaining what all of these does so that it's easier for the user to understand. With that in place, let's see how our application looks like right now. As you can see, we have this UI to select the code execution environment. And we also have this help message which says all the essential things that the user needs to know. And with this execution environment selection UI, we have a new variable called execution env. And based on this environment, we are going to decide where we are going to run our code. Since we now have two system prompts, one for local and one for Docker, we are also going to update the base messages where we are saying if the execution environment is Docker, we are going to pass the Docker execution prompt. But if we are selecting either local or non, we are just going to use the local execution prompt. This will make sure that we are storing images is on the right path like i mentioned earlier and now based on what execution environment the user has selected we are going to execute the code accordingly so we need to update this line and we have this new code block so we are going to create an empty variable called executed result which is assigned to none and if the user has selected the execution environment as local we are going to print uh, executing in local machine and we are just going to pass the temporary file path inside of the execute local function and if the execution environment is docker we are going to pass the temporary file path to the execute docker and once we have that if we have any executed result and if any of those result have .png and jpg it's going to display the image and it's going to write so for that we are going to update this code block so if the execution environment is local we are going to get the image path from the local machine itself so we don't need to do anything the code remains as it is but if we are getting the image or if the execution environment is in docker then we know that the image is saved on the temporary directory that we passed earlier so if we go to the docker execution environment we are mounting the temporary directory where our temporary file exists inside of the slash application so whenever it saves an image it's going to be slash app slash image dot jpz dot png or whatever and it directly resonates to the image being saved inside of the temporary directory with the same name we are just constructing the path to get to the correct image based on the result returned from the execution and as well as the temporary directory we are using right now with that in place our application is completed and now let's look at the demo of how this works for this i'm going to choose docker as the execution environment and i'm going to use the previous prompt that i used during the demo so create a bar chart showing the growing use of generative ai so it's going to generate dummy data and it's going to save the image inside of the docker container which we can get on our temporary directory as well and display it as this so that's it for this video thank you for watching i hope you had a great time learning how to use code interpreter with large language models and unlocking a new world of possibilities that you can go out and explore because the things you can do with this is pretty cool so if you like this video give me a thumbs up if you want to see such contents in the future do subscribe to my channel and i'll see you in the next one